Good morning. This summer we are spending our time immersed in the story of Joseph. It's a story where God is everywhere active, but never audible. Unlike with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph gets no direct words from God. Instead, he is given dreams and called to trust God based on the words that have already been spoken, based on what God has already done and promised. In short, Joseph's story is much like our own. This morning, we begin that story in Genesis 37, beginning in verse verse 1. So feel free to turn there with me. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Genesis 37, beginning in verse 1. But before we hear God's word this morning, please take a moment to pray with me. Lord, as we hear your firm and unchanging word, help us to trust in your faithfulness in a shifting and ever-changing world. Open our ears to your word and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So listen closely and listen well, for these are the very words of God. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were binding our sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose and stood upright, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. He had another dream and told it to his brothers, saying, The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So so Israel said to him, Go now. See if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So we sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are shepherding the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Jacob went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance. and Before he had come near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, 
here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him, throw him here into this pit in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. It was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where can I go? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, This we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Jacob is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garment, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I will go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus his father bewailed him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was walking down College Avenue in Holland, Michigan. Jeff and I were talking about vocation and how to know what God wanted us to do with our lives. Jeff, now middle-aged, reflected on the deep struggle he had when he was younger to know God's will for his life. And as we began to talk about trying to follow God when he felt distant, Jeff turned to me and said, Sometimes in life with God, you're on the mountain peaks, and sometimes you're in the valley. When I was younger, I used to think that when I was in the valley, that meant there was something wrong with me, that I was somehow unfaithful. But as I've grown older, I've learned that this is the normal pattern for our spiritual life, peaks and valleys. Sometimes it's just the path God has called you to walk right now. You haven't done anything wrong. You're just called to walk with God in the valley right now. Peaks and valleys. Joseph's story is the story of God's faithfulness in the valley. It's the story of God working when we do not hear him or do not see him, when life is in the pit in the valley, again and again. In Joseph's story, we see a window into what Paul was saying in Romans 8, 28, 
but we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So as we look more closely at the story of Joseph in Genesis 37, I believe we will see more deeply just what it means to say, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So let's get started. Joseph begins as the beloved son, and then he is sent by his father to his brothers who hate him, plot to kill him, and cast him into a pit, only later for Joseph to be lifted out again. And the first thing we see is that Joseph begins as the beloved son. It's verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. Joseph was the beloved and exalted son. Jacob had 12 sons, if we assume Benjamin's already born at this point. He had six sons by Leah, whom Jacob was tricked into marrying by their father Laban, uh, two each by maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah, and lastly two by Rachel, the wife Jacob intended to marry in the first place. So Joseph is the oldest of the sons of Rachel, though by far one of the younger of the brothers. And Jacob loved Joseph more than all his brothers. Now that does not mean that Jacob did not love his other children, or that he mistreated or disliked his other sons, but only that Joseph was favored above his brothers. Now, we could look at this and see nothing more than sinful favoritism. Jacob favors one son over another, and it causes strife. And it is clear that Jacob doesn't quite grasp how his sons feel toward Jacob, or towards Joseph, but we're not told that this was sinful favoritism. Jacob clothes Joseph as if he is the heir. He treats him as the favored son, and he signals that role by giving him a special piece of clothing. The NRSV says a long robe with sleeves. The, the King James says a coat of many colors. Honestly, this is a really difficult phrase to translate, but what we do know is that this robe would have been a symbol of Joseph's authority. Joseph's position as heir and future leader of the family was shown by this special robe of authority. And this introduces a theme that comes up again and again in the Joseph story. Clothing is connected with authority. So when Joseph is robed and when his robes are stripped off are deeply symbolic of his position and authority. So Joseph is the beloved and exalted son. He is treated as the heir of the house, which means he would report directly to his father and be trained in administering the whole family business. This explains why Joseph isn't always with his brothers in the field, but sometimes he is, but he's often with his father. It's not that he's being protected and sheltered, he's 17 years old, but he's being trained to manage the whole family and all the servants and the flocks. But we've seen that he begins as the beloved and exalted son. He's loved by his father. He's treated and trained as the heir to the kingdom, and his father dresses him accordingly. But what do his brothers think of all of this? They hate him. Verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So even if Jacob was right to exalt Joseph and robe him as the heir, his brothers hated it. They hated being passed over as their father's favor rested on Joseph and not on them. And every time Joseph did the right thing, it only made them angrier. So we learn in verse 2 that sometimes Joseph did go out in the flock with the flocks to help his brothers, and he was a helper to the, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, so that'd be Gad, Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. And one time, Joseph gave a bad report about them to their father. It's possible Joseph was a tattletale, but if he's robed as the beloved son and he's being trained to be the heir, then it's quite possible, especially given that Jacob later sends Joseph to get a report on the brothers, that Joseph was just doing what his father asked. 
There's no indication it was a false report either. The brothers did wrong, and Joseph reported it to their father, and they hated him for it. They hated him because their father loved him, and he reported their misdeeds, and it only gets worse and worse as Joseph begins to dream. Joseph has two dreams. First, he tells his brothers of a dream where they're binding wheat in the field, and his brother's sheaves bow down to his. And everyone who hears it rightly assumes the truth of these dreams. The brothers immediately know what is happening. They interpret the bowing down as a dream that the brothers will eventually serve Joseph. And so they hate him more and more. The next dream he tells his father and his brothers. Now we have the the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him. And again, they immediately understand what the dream means. Not just the brothers, but now... Joseph's father and mother will bow down to him. Here, Jacob even rebukes Joseph. And the brothers now move from hatred to more hatred to jealousy. But Jacob reserves judgment. At this point, we see a mounting tension in the story. Joseph is beloved. He is exalted. And whether this is completely right or there's some latent favoritism in in it, Joseph has been given the position of heir to the household. He's received favor from his father. He's been given dreams by God in which the family will bow down to him. And he's been robed with authority. He's been elevated. And Joseph himself has done nothing wrong. And the response to this elevation and this promised power to the son is hatred. Hatred builds to more hatred twists into jealousy, and will soon give birth to murderous plots. Now, maybe Joseph wasn't prudent to tell his brother his dreams, but this certainly doesn't justify their hatred. Joseph receives a dream. He receives power and responsibility. He receives the love of his father, and the brothers hate him for it. They hate him not because he is bad, or he is wicked, or he does wrong, but because he has been promised good things. And has been blessed. And yet Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. How? How can we say this? When Joseph, who has done nothing wrong, is hated by his brothers. Sometimes we suffer, not because we have done wrong, but because we are following God. Joseph heeded the dreams. He he wore the robe of authority. He listened well to his father and was hated for it. He was hated not for his wickedness, but for his righteousness. And sometimes we, followers of Jesus, suffer the animosity and the vitriol of others, not because we are wrong, but because we are right. Jesus tells us to expect this when we follow him. Peter and Paul caution us to make sure we're suffering for doing right and not for doing wrong, but they tell us to expect it all the same. Sometimes the reward for following God is hatred and struggle. I would love to be able to tell you today that if you follow God, people will love you and things will always go right for you and that if life is hard, it's because you're walking away from God. It would be simpler than the truth. However, the truth is that, like Joseph, following God does not always mean things go smoothly. It doesn't always mean people will respond with joy. Sometimes quite the opposite. Sometimes when light shines in the darkness, things that prefer to hide in the dark are exposed, and they hate us for it. So at this point, Joseph is the beloved son, and he is hated by his brothers, for nothing that he himself has done wrong, but hated simply because he is beloved. But at this point, Jacob shows he doesn't understand what's going on with his sons. So his other sons have taken the flock quite a few days' journey from home to pasture them. In order to get an update, Jacob sends Joseph to them. And after being redirected to their location, the brothers see Joseph at a distance, and they begin to plot. He dreams of ruling over us. Hard to do that when he's dead. 
it wouldn't even be that difficult to, to cover it up. We can throw his body into a pit, an empty cistern. If there's no body, we can just say a wild animal did it. Dad will never know. Only Reuben cautions against murder. Only Reuben, the oldest of all the brothers, the firstborn of Leah, the only one who should truly be angry that Joseph is heir and not him, this Reuben says not to harm Joseph. As an alternative to murder, Reuben suggests they simply throw Joseph into the pit, but they leave him alive. And the brothers agree. And when Joseph arrives, he is stripped of his robe. Stripped symbolically of his power, of his position, of his role as the beloved son, as the exalted son. They take it off from him. And they cast him into the pit. Joseph was sent by his father to his brothers, who hate him, reject him, plot to kill him, and cast him into a pit. And then comes the most heart-wrenching line of the whole chapter. It's verse 25. Then they sat down to eat. Joseph lying in the pit. Joseph stripped and cast down to the very depths they put him in. Joseph crying out. And the brothers sit down to eat. They will later reflect that they heard Joseph's cries but didn't listen. They sat down to a meal. They filled their stomachs, and rested their bodies, all while their brother cried out in fear, pain, and agony in the very pit they cast him into. They sat down with food stuffed in their mouths while their brother's cries came in their ears. The callous indifference to the suffering of their brother, the lack of remorse, the audacity to serve yourself to a meal while closing your ears to your brother's cries. If, like me, you've spent most of this morning finding yourself sympathizing with Joseph, thinking about the times you have followed God and entered into the valley, or found yourself in the pit, or suffered for it, it's important that we also take a moment to consider whether we are not only like Joseph, but at times like the brothers. Whose voices are crying out that we refuse to hear? While we sit restless, but comfortable in our homes, sitting down to eat, who is crying out that we close our ears to hear? It's been a painful two weeks for me as I watch the news coming from the States. It's like watching a family member slowly destroy herself. You may not live with her anymore, but it, it guts you to watch her do this to herself. George Floyd, dead. Suffocated to, to death by a police officer while cameras were rolling. The cries of pain of a black community who says, why does this happen to us yet again? Year after year, decade after decade, our sons and daughters are killed and beaten, kept from opportunities, and looked on as less, as little more than thugs. They cry out, and their voices are not heard. They cry out, and America sits down to eat, forgetting that it was they who threw them in the pit in the first place. And now the cries of pain mix with justified anger and swirl from, from protests into riots. They knelt, and no one listened. They silently marched and no one listened. And now we have fires and destruction, tear gas and rubber bullets, National Guard and armored vehicles enforcing curfew and patrolling the streets in my hometown. And as I've grieved and tried to find ways to talk to, to Olga or even begin to explain to my children what is happening, I've been haunted by this image of the brothers sitting down to eat beside the pit. Whose voices are crying out that we refuse to hear? While we sit restless but comfortable in our homes, sitting down to eat, who is crying out that we close our ears to hear? In Canada, our history with race and injustice is a different story than that of our neighbors to the south. 
Yet as grateful as I am to live here, we are not immune to the forces of sin. We too have voices that go unheard and privilege that goes unseen. And whose voices are crying out that we refuse to hear? While we sit down to eat, who cries out that we close our ears? And if you don't know, perhaps it's time to listen. Perhaps it's time to get up and to learn and to listen to the voices of those who are crying out, even our brothers and our sisters. For some of us, we may know what it's like to be Joseph, to try to cling to God and walk with him in the pit. To be faithful and find yourself cast down, not just in spite of your faithfulness, but because of it. It's also wise for us to take time to consider whether we are also like the brothers, sitting down to eat while our brothers and sisters languish. And as the brothers sat down to eat, a caravan of Ishmaelites comes by. Judah proposes a way to profit off of getting rid of Joseph. At this, at his suggestion, they draw Joseph up and cast him into a new pit, a pit of slavery. All that is left is the cover-up. Reuben comes back. He was evidently not part of this plot, and he's torn up by what they have done. And then the brothers take the special robe. They, they slaughter a goat and dip the robe in the blood. And they send it to their father to deceive him about what has happened. This is Jacob, who deceived his father with goat skins and garments, is now deceived by his own sons with goat blood on a garment. And though the brothers don't identify the robe, Jacob recognizes it immediately. He tears his robe and enters into mourning. And though all his family seeks to comfort him, Jacob stays in mourning until he meets Joseph again, alive all those years later. This is where we leave Joseph in our story this morning. Cast into the pit, then lifted out of the pit, only to be cast into slavery. We get hints of something in the selling of Joseph to Potiphar. But this is where we leave Joseph, in the pit. In the pit for being faithful, for being beloved. Yet God's word says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. How is that true here? How is this true for, for Joseph and Jacob? Joseph ends up hated, cast into the pit, only then to be cast into slavery. And Jacob has struggled his whole life with his brother. And when he's finally at peace, he sends his beloved son off to his brothers only to get a bloody garment in what does it mean that all things work together for good here? In this story, to see the hand of God, we have to look beyond the story itself. If our vision is only focused on this chapter, this story, this event, it is difficult to see how God works all together for good. But when we look broader, when we look bigger, when we see the whole story of what God has done and will do in Joseph, we can begin to see how it is true that all things work together for good. At this moment in the story, it's nothing but down, down, down. And what happens to Joseph is not good, but evil. But when we look back in light of the whole story, we see God's faithful hand at work. This doesn't minimize the suffering of or the wailing of Joseph in the pit. It doesn't trivialize Jacob's bewailing of his son. But it gives us confidence in the faithfulness of God even when we cannot see it. For there are times for us right now where we can't see the whole story. Or right now it just looks like down, down, down. And we wonder, God, how can you work this together for good? And at this point we cannot see. We are in the valley and our vision is like looking through the fog. We're like Joseph in the pit. But the, the broader story of Joseph, 
gives us confidence that our faithful God will work things for good, even if we can't see it yet. Because Joseph, the beloved son, is cast down into the pit, but he's sold into the house of Potiphar. And in Potiphar's house, Joseph will rise up, only to be cast down again into prison. Then he's lifted up again to the right hand of Pharaoh, and he blesses the whole world. Three times Joseph is cast down, only later to be brought out again. And by the end of the story, God has turned all the evil actions, including the hatred and betrayal of the brothers, in such a way that Joseph is a blessing to the nations. The very plot to destroy Joseph will end up being the brother's salvation and that of the world. And this is not an isolated incident. This isn't just a fun story of what happened to some person long ago. This is the way of God in this world. God takes evil and wickedness and turns it inside out and upside down for the sake of salvation. The story of Joseph going down, 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 only to be brought up for the salvation of the world, points ahead to the story, the story of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the beloved and exalted Son of the Father. He is robed in majesty, and his power and glory were predicted long ago. And he is sent by his Father to his brothers, who hated him, rejected him, and plotted to kill him. Jesus is the one who, when asked who he was seeking, would echo the voice of Joseph, I am seeking my brothers. And it was Jesus who was cast into the pit of death, only to be brought out again three days later. And the plot to destroy Jesus ends up being our salvation. And at his final exaltation, Jesus brings blessing to the whole world. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. This is not a call just to put on a happy face, but a promise rooted in what we see here in the life of Joseph. That even the works of evil, even undeserved hatred and scorn can be turned by God toward his greater purposes in this world. It is a promise rooted in what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ the greater Joseph, who went down into the depths of the deepest pit for us and for our salvation, and God raised him from the dead. As I walked down College Avenue, Jeff turned to me and said, sometimes in life with God you were on the mountain peaks, and sometimes you were in the valley. Peaks and valleys, sometimes this is just the path God has set you to walk right now. You haven't done anything wrong, you are just called to walk with God in the valley right now. The God who lifted Joseph up from the pit, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, is the same God who is near to you in your valleys and promises that one day all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the story of Joseph. We thank you for his example of one who walks with you and suffers for his righteousness, who, who goes silently like a lamb to the slaughter. We thank you for the ways that Joseph points ahead to Jesus, our greater Joseph, who went down into the pit for us and for our salvation and was raised to bring blessing to the world. We pray that as we find ourselves not just on peaks in our life with you, but walking in the valley, find our life in the pit, that you would give us confidence in your promises, that you would give us confidence that just as you have done with Joseph, just as you have done with Jesus, so you have promised to do to us, do for us. And while we walk in the valley, may you also open our ears to the cries of our brothers and sisters, that we may not be like the brothers who sit down to eat while their brother cries, but we 
may be more like you who hears the cry of the afflicted. We pray all this in the beautiful name of Jesus.